everyone to the uh, colloquium of uh, Center for Theoretical Physics. Today, our guest is uh, Professor Jan Pedenczuk from uh, the University of Oslo. Uh, he's a professor there and he's a specialist in quantum entanglement, quantum metrology, uh, in uh, quantum optics, and uh, also Bose and computation. And today, he will be talking about many bell correlations in physics. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail, for your invitation. And could you give me the So I will uh, make a brief tour through some projects devoted to the generation and uh, detection of many body correlations in spin systems. And uh, these projects wouldn't be possible without the collaboration with a number of people, mostly Emilia and Martin and uh, Michael Levenstein, who you might know. Uh, and also Thomas Barsam, uh, who is now in Toro, in New York Park, who is an associate professor at our faculty, and the ex PhD student, Dr. Nisgoda, and the current PhD student from Pakistan, Danish. So the uh, outline is very concise, it's just three points. I will uh, speak about first, I will invoke the, the textbook scheme of uh, Vernon O'Kalipi, which most of us. Learn at uh, learning our courses of quantum mechanics. And uh, once the, the stage is set, I will move to uh, more particles and higher order correlation functions as means of detecting this kind of uh, exotic behaviors or correlations, if you prefer. And finally, I will show how this applies to uh, statistic, statical and dynamical problems in two, two systems. So, uh, spin chains and uh, uh, Bose Eisner condensate, so indistinguishable particles with two degrees of freedom. So, this is are just three points. Uh, mostly, I will focus on these two and then a brief uh, mention about the application. My main goal is actually to show that uh, it is not, it's quite simple. Uh, so, uh, the textbook. That's not my point. The textbook by inequality, which you uh, probably all must have encountered in your studies, uh, is a result of a discussion which was started by uh, the trio of Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen back in 35. At this stage, people already realized that there is something strange about uh, some predictions of quantum mechanics. And uh, in particular, this Strange behavior, uh, strange feature was uh, related to a possibility of one system to somehow, so to say, steer or control the other. Non locally, what seemed to be non local, and without any apparent interaction, which seemed to defy what we are used to, though probably we don't uh, state it every day when we wake up in the morning, which is the local, the postulates of, of local reality. And then, so this was 1935. The title of the ATR paper is Can Quantum Mechanical Description of Physical Reality Be Considered Complete? And the obvious suggestion, at least for me, of this title is that it cannot. And then uh, it took almost 30 years, as you can see, from 35 to 64, 29 years, up until uh, Bell, uh, in his seminal work, showed that either you have quantum mechanics with all its Goods and bads, or you have uh, local values. You cannot, you can explain some quantum mechanical features with a local realistic theory, but not all. There are some systems, some states which defy these postulates, and either this or that. And finally, I will briefly tell in this introductory uh, two slides about one particular way of detecting these non-local correlations, what we call non-local or bell correlations, is maybe a more, more secure way to say, which is the uh, clauser horn nashimonia holds inequality formulated in 69. And this will be the, the basic stuff. And the basic stuff is the simplest possible complex system you could think of, which consists of two parts. So the complexity resides in two parts. First of all, there are two subsystems. And second of all, each of these subsystems has two degrees, so have one degree of freedom and two possibilities. This is the simplest possible. Okay. 
The other, uh, a simpler scenario would be, for instance, having one outcome of a local measurement for A and for B. Is it someone communicating? Uh, I could please mute the online audience. Mm. It would be simpler to have just one possible outcome of local measurement I, A, and I, B per mm. side, but then the, the, the local dynamics is frozen. There is nothing to do apart from imprinting a face. But if you have, if you want to have some more complex dynamics, you need to have at least two systems, and this is what I have to do. So these A's and B's, they denote local settings. For instance, if you think about uh, target pontos, this could be orientations of your polar polarizers. And uh, we assume binary objects at the object. There is no quantum mechanics here, okay? This is a, a system A, B, two possibilities here, two possibilities here, and some possibility of changing the, some orientation of whatever you want to occur. And uh, to say briefly what local relevance means in this context, you need to construct a correlation of this outcome. So what you do, you have your A and B, you set you set orientation of something, uh, polarizer or Stengerlach or whatever you want, and then you measure this quantity to which you have access. And this quantity only can give you one or minus one. So it's you in one experiment you obtain one minus one blah blah all these four possibilities. You multiply these outcomes in one experiment. You multiply so the the product will be other one or minus one. And uh, your average over an, an ensemble, which is a, whatever it is, your ensemble, whatever it gives you these outcomes. So you construct a, a correlation function, which will depend on how you pick this orientation, A and B. And as I said, this is a product of IA and IB, averaged over whatever you average. And Local realism means, first of all, local. It means that this, this A's and B's do not depend cross on each other. So if I change something in A here from some A to some other A prime, this does not influence this index here. This is locality. And uh, uh, realism means that there is an underlying physical process which is objective which de which determines these outcomes we might not possess the full knowledge of this hence we represent it with some probability distribution <laughs> of something that is often called a hidden variable it's called hidden because it is assumed that we do not have access to, ho to hold this information and it is not clear from your whatever you're dealing, you're dealing with the Schrodinger equation or whatever but at the end, uh, it must, this correlation must, it must be possible to represent it in this way. And the whole game of all this bell stuff and all this talk is to construct proper correlation functions or maybe more complex systems than just two schemes. And to be able to somehow experimentally, or at least on paper, but in a, in a definite way, to tell if your correlation function can be written in this way. And that's it. There's nothing more. And in 1969, uh, this uh, quartet of Klaus, uh, Horn, and Shimon, and Rahol, they uh, mm, had an idea of somehow upgrading the original idea of, of Bell. His formulation is a bit, at least for me, uh, a bit difficult sometimes to grasp. Like the inequality they propose, so a method of testing if this object can be written in this way is very simple. What you do, you take, you measure IA, so measure your whatever you have access to at orientation A at A and A prime, so you change from small A to A prime and from small B to B prime. 
And this way you have four possibilities in total A, B, like here, A prime B, A, B prime, A prime, B prime. And you, uh, the CHSH inequality, which we, as we call it, is a linear combination of these four possibilities. So again, experimentally, this means you or you pick an orientation of your polarizer here and here, measure the spin, uh, the uh, orientation of your, uh, I don't know, polarization of your light or whatever you pick. Then you change one setting from B to B prime, from A to A prime, leaving B as original, and A prime to A B prime. You make this combination. And if these outcomes are indeed the uh, plus minus one, then it is very simple. Uh, two lines on a Wikipedia uh, argument that this is more than equal than to the absolute value of this combination. If this holds. So again, if this is true, what is written here, then th this combination is always smaller or equal to me. If you find a system which violates this inequality under these assumptions of uh, binary outcomes, this means that you some something is not true here, which is part of the expression is not true. It's not always clear, but this is enough. Okay, so this is our CHSH. And uh, obviously we you tested with quantum systems. So this means that you replace the average of uh, local measurements with, with like quantum mechanical prescription. You replace it with the observables. And since these are plus minus one possibilities, you can map it onto all some Pauli matrices. These Pauli matrices are for system A and system B. And they have some uh, orientations on the blow sphere, A, B, or whatever, whichever you want on, on blow sphere of each individual spin one half. So you measure this object. So you, you calculate this object. Now you need to tell over what you, your average is here. For instance, if you pick a, a, a sim, simple entangled state, which is a, a single state, and uh, so you take the single state, then you sandwich sigma A and sigma B, pick orientations X, X, Y, Y, and some make it with some local rotations. This is what you get. This is, you know, this is like a standard introductory quantum mechanics calculation. This is actually the maximal value that quantum mechanics allows for. And this is bigger than this, which means that the E, which is the main uh, part of this expression, cannot be written in this classical order. And that's it. And th therefore, we say that quantum mechanics defies the postulates of the local learning. Now, there is the question what is actually the, which part of the statement about local variance is true? For instance, maybe it is so that uh, there is a global reality, which means that the whole universe, I, I know it sounds fantastic to you, science, complete science fiction, but in principle, you could have. Uh, you could imagine a situation that the whole universe shares some information, which is shared in this way. What you think is local is not local because you are you, you acting in a universe which somehow through some theorem or whatever it is is mediating information or it shares the information. So there are many science fiction possibilities of what is actually true, and this I guess we will never know. We just have to admit that we we have found the contradictions to the postulates of local realism as a whole. <laughs> okay, so this was the textbook. Now we uh, scale up. Scale up I, by scale up, I mean there are two things you can change. First of all, you increase the number of, of the spins. This is the first thing, but you stick to using two-body correlation function. And the second step is while having this large number of spins, increasing also the order of correlation with which you test the property, the non-local properties of the system. 
And uh, the first approach has an advantage that it's uh, it's simpler to test the experiment because if these are two body correlation functions, they are already more or less accessible in, in atomic systems, in photonic chemistry. So this approach, uh, for instance, was successfully used in a work by uh, Remy Piusch and uh, Maciej Levenstein and Tony Asin. This is a theoretical work from uh, 2014 from Science, where they demonstrated how having n qubits, they assume they, they are bosonic, so there is permutational invariance, and you replace every pair of qubits. So you have n qubits and access to first and second order correlation function only, nothing else. How in such a system to test the presence of their correlations? So this is theory, an experiment followed soon from group in Basel of Philip Freudlein, and they just used the, the prescription, which I will briefly now discuss, to demonstrate the presence of pair correlations in a really many body system of thousands. So the idea is the following. First of all, you construct this collective spin operators because we are dealing with bosons, so you cannot ask, address them individually. You have to do collective stuff. So you have a collective one body part. So this is a summation over all, all spins you have. And this one here denotes some orientation of your other spin. Sigma X, sigma Y, or Z, or an and an other orientation on the box. So this is the one body. This is the, this part, one body function. And this is the two body. So the correlation of two spins, you take two guys, you must sum over all possibilities, again, to have collective uh, operators. And again, you can uh, align your sigma of the first qubit, symmetrized and second, along any picked two axis. So once you have this S1 and S2, S12, they have shown, this is a kind of complicated big calculation, that you can construct an equality in the following way. To take this S at some orientation they call zero. So this, let's, for instance, along the Z axis in your system. Then you take S0, zero. So this means that you take a two body correlation function along Z and Z, both are along the same axis. Then you change one axis here, a change here. This axis are perpendicular. They are, in principle, there can be an angular among them. I will discuss this, in, I will show the experimental data where exactly this is what they did. They had one axis and then they controlled the, the, the angle in, in some way. Uh, sorry, and this should be, uh, 0, 1, and 2 should be 1, 0. Plus 2, the time, the number of qubits is bigger than equal 0 for any system that is consistent with local life. So if you measure these objects, and these are collective spin operators, you can do it in, in atomic systems, and you show that the outcome is smaller than 0, you're at home. Okay? So this, this, this is the violation of value. But this bank inequality, again, is not as standard as for two qubits because it's a bigger system, but it is still constructed as previously only on second order and first order correlations. And the experiment was done in, uh, as I said, in Basel with a BC of, as far as I remember, a few thousand of atoms. There are two degrees of freedom for each atom were encoded in the hyperfine structure. And these atoms were allowed, they were sitting in one trap and they were allowed to interact. Two body collisions, which we know correlate the system and in principle can construct very strong correlations. So you allow them to interact for some time. Once the time, this moment is, is finished, you measure this object and as, I, as you said, the, uh, you control the angle between the axes. And this is the plot as a function of angle of, of the left hand side of this. And as you see, there are <laughs> this is the theoretical prediction, and there are regions where your outcome drops below zero, 
safety within the uh, experimental. So all that is, I would say, within this experimental errors below zero is a proof that there exists bad correlations in the system. This is not a proof on lo of non-locality because they all sit all together. If you want to really do the full belt scheme, you, have, you would need to scatter them you know, all over the place and then be able to do these measurements locally. So this is a witness of presence of bad correlations, so a potential of the system to show some truly non-local stuff. So this was a very successful and important work. Uh, important work. And uh, uh, what I will now do, I will briefly show you how to go a step further with the price of growing complexity, but still I would say it's quite simple. So we now stick to many body, but we release this construct. So we go to the many body systems, many body correlation functions, and I will argue how surprising the versatile this year could so. So we have an in general, an object, whatever it is. I do not uh, specify at this moment that you have binary outcomes, not yet. And you measure something for each of them. These are your local observables, spins or whatever you want, positions. And they depend, as in the original Bell scheme, on local surface. So you locally eat something. And Exactly the same as in the original verse argument. You measure this in each experiment independently and calculate the product of these outcomes and average over your own sum. And this is your correlation function, which depends on this set of n local settings. And just as previously, if this object, this, can be expressed in a uh, local, in, in terms of local realism, so in terms of theory which is consistent with local realism, this means that you can express it as an average over some hidden or simply multivariate variable with some probability distribution of a product of this local object. And the goal now is to construct, again, just uh, previously, you construct some inequality to test if this is true or not. And that's it. So this is our correlation. <clears throat> and non-classical means that this is true. And uh, I will now argue that uh, this an object like this can detect different types of correlations, not only the strongest ones, which are called the bell correlation, but also the entanglement and what we what resides in between. Namely, entanglement is a type of correlation which, re which occurs when you assume quantum mechanical systems. What does it mean? This means that for each of these outcomes, each of these objects which are here are calculated according to the rules of quantum mechanics. So they are calculated, you replace is with dash E, which is a local observable. This is your local density matrix, local or what particular arrow here. And you calculate the rest. So this is an, so here, this is general. I'm not saying at this moment how these objects are calculated. Now I am imposing a constraint saying that each of these objects is calculated in this way. And this is indeed a constraint, as I will show them. So, if you plug this in here, and if you are able to show that the correlation function cannot be written in this form, this means that your state is not, cannot be expressed in this way, which we say is non-separable, or if you prepare is unbound. So, in other words, this kind of correlation can test if your many body system is entangled or not. Now, there is an intermediate. Is... Well, there is something I don't understand because you have local states there in this expression. So if you plug it uh, there, you get a local. No, what, what I'm saying is 
if you take if you calculate a correlation of this E's, okay, and assume an object like this, then your correlation function will take this form. Mm -hmm. If it does not take this form, assuming that, then this means that this assumption is not. Yeah, it is maybe a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, uh, there is an intermediate step on this ladder, which is called the einstein todorsky rosenstein and which goes back to the original EPL argument. And uh, in this language, this means that we do not assume quantum mechanical systems for all subsystems. Some are quantum mechanical, some are more relaxed. You relax the constraint, for instance, of a qubit living on a block sphere, which is a constraint. And this way, it is in some sense more, more general. And you can show that in such subsystems, for instance, this more relaxed subsystem can force the quantum one to locally violate, for instance, Heisenberg and certainty principle. So you take locally one qubit, and you think, okay, this should the Heisenberg and certainty principles, so it must be satisfied. But since there is this other relaxed subsystem, which can steer the other one, it can pull you locally because you forget about the presence of the other one. And this can influence this qubit and force it to violate uh, a certain it's an uncertainty principle for the spins, yeah? yes. For instance, yes. But this could, but here I'm not assuming about spins here. Okay. So this could be uh, quadratures of electromagnetic field and stuff. Mm -hmm. And bed lock non locality assumes, so to say, almost nothing. You just assume, for instance, binary outcomes, but you are not constrained to be a, a qubit living on a block sphere. So there, there is, this is a, the, there are three steps of the ladder of quantum correlations. This is the most restrictive because you assume quantum mechanics. Here you assume only for some parts, and here you do not assume quantum mechanical, and therefore it is the most typically most difficult to violate the last one. Example. Let's take three spins, and uh, uh, for each of them we measure two two objects. These are not power matrices yet. There is no quantum mechanics. You measure some sigma x, whatever it is, and sigma y. So these are, for instance, as always two possible orientations, but this could be whatever you want. We assume it is binary for each subsystem. And for each, so the experiment looks like this. You have three subsystems. You measure plus minus one here, plus minus one, plus minus one. And you construct locally, by locally I mean that for a fixed subsystem, something which resembles the hourly raising of a regulatory field go to quantum mechanics, but it's not quantum mechanics. It's just C numbers, plus minus one, plus minus one. But if it's not quantum mechanics, why it should be plus minus one? It can be plus. It can be, but you can always, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't help. It's just the weather way of normalizing your outcomes so they're con then consistent. Okay. So you, you this is not a constraint. It is just a method of uh, being compatible with the language you will use. Okay, It's not a constraint. Okay. So now the question is, once you have the system, how to construct a correlator to test all this stuff that I told you? And the idea is the following. You take the sigma plus you constructed for the first part, sigma plus for the second and for the third. You multiply them, average and take modulus. And if this object is again classical, in a sense that is uh, consistent with local realism, then again you can write it this way. So the modulus square is here to kill these eyes which are present here. And inside, Writes, uh, leaves this expression for the average, just as previous. And you can use the Cauchy Schwartz inequality for complex integrals. So, an integral, complex integral model of square is smaller equivalent than integral of model of square. Okay, so this is uh, our, uh, our correlator. 
these are our local uh, objects. And now, assume quantum mechanics for each subsystem. What does it mean? This means that each of these objects is calculated with raising operators. Now, this is represented as a local, locally measured observable. So it's a trace of a raising operator for i qubit times its density matrix modulus. And since the raising operator is sigma x plus i sigma y, and it is constrained to a block sphere, this cannot be bigger than one block. So if quantum mechanics holds for this, this, and this independently, this is one fourth, one fourth, one fourth. So this is mark the maximal value you can do. If you violate this inequality for three binary systems, this means you have an entanglement. So this inequality E3, three, three here denotes three subsystems. Smaller equal 164 is a uh, criterion for entanglement. Okay. On the other uh, side of the spectrum of quantum correlations is, is the Bellman locality, which means that for each of these objects, I do not as have this restriction to the velocity. These are just binary outcomes, plus minus one. So the modulus square of, of a binary outcome, this is one. This is one. So this is one half. As you see, you can reach a higher bar. In this sense, quantum mechanics here is a restriction because for quantum systems, you are on one fourth. It's a loss here for any binary outcome. You need. So again, if this can be one half, one half, one half, this is the maximal value of E3 you can obtain assuming local rise here. If you violate this, so if you have E3 which is bigger than one eighth for three binary systems, you have a binary quality violation. Excuse me, sorry for a stupid question. This type of inequality, unlike this CSHS before, does not require any kind of A or A prime labels or something. No, 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 they are here because the sigma plus is X and Y. You see, there are two settings per side. So, so you have to somehow choose random here. Different yes, it's this is still reserved. The general scheme is still used. So there is this uh, open, you, you plot this block of quantum correlations from all quantum systems. Inside of them, there, there leaves a, a subset of those that are entangled. And within them, a more exotic subsystem is those which uh, are EPR steering and bell inequality, bell non-locality is the most fundamental from my perspective and exotic and most difficult to measure type of correlation. And uh, this type of inequality, this type, this object, I will use in the remaining uh, 10 minutes or so of my talk to apply to me measure non-local stuff in, uh, in, in many of the systems. This I learned from a work of Cavalcanti, uh, Margaret Ray, Peter Drano, this is a uh, peer from 2007. Then they somehow discussed this in, in the following papers. And uh, it, it turns out that this kind of uh, bell correlations belong to the broadest possible types of detecting non locality, which was found by Marek Zhukovsky and Chostrov Buchner in 2002. This, all these papers are from my community, I would say, very important. So, what I'm going to say is that I learned this from a paper. It's not naturally, it's not my intention. Okay, so this is for n part. So far, we had E3 and three objects. Now we go to n, and we have n body correlation functions, which is extremely difficult to measure, but it is very easy to calculate. This is the binary quality. You remember for three particles, we get one half to the power of three. Now we have one half to the power of n. <coughs> this is the criterion for entanglement. For three particles, we have one fourth to the power of three. We have one fourth to the power of n. And uh, if you take, for instance, a, a GHZ state, so all spins up plus all down, coherence of a position, then you can calculate this trivial because 
you have n raising operators. So this acts on this n down and it puts them all up, which will have, if you bracket it with this object from two sides, this will give you the maximal possible value. So in other words, there are some states which violate this, otherwise, otherwise it would be a irrelevant discussion. And what is important? Although this object is a super complicated and body correlation function, at the end, it is expressed as just a single element of the density. Why? Because whatever quantum state you have of your spins, the n-fold action of raising operator contributes only when it acts all spins down. It brings them all up. So there is only one element of the density matrix, which is this J, J Z times of coherence between up, all up and all down, that is relevant. So <laughs> although it looks horrible, it is just one, one single element of the density matrix, which from which you can squeeze a lot of information about many body entanglement, many body non-locality. And this can be measured in some spin systems, it can be already accessed this way. You don't need to reconstruct the full density. You need not write the most exotic one element, which is the extreme correlation between all ups and downs, but just a single element. And last but not least, let me just tell that uh, you don't need to restrict to all plus and all uh, raising operators. You can have some number of raising, some lowering. It's your choice how you adapt this, uh, this type of object locally. This depends on the, so to say, geometry of your problem. Okay. So I'm left with 10 minutes maximum. So I will make a very brief discussion with some most important. So uh, the first one was done with Artemis Goda, which was done uh, in uh, a PhD student with me and uh, Miłosz Panfil, who is uh, an expert uh, at our faculty on solid state physics and the spin chain stuff. So you take, uh, this is very simple system, you take uh, the easing Hamiltonian, so a two-body interact uh, uh, interaction between the nearest neighbors, plus uh, orthogonal magnetic field, and you do the static, static problem. So you uh, calculate the ground state for a small number of spins because you have this dimensionality curve, and you calculate, calculate ground state, and then the, this uh, correlator is uh, E6, and you plot it. This is as a function of G. This is our E6. At some g, so you want, if you want to have strong correlations, you want to have small g, because if it is big, then the one body part dominates over the two body part, and the correlator is small. But if g is sufficiently small, then you break this two to the minus five. This is for six particles, okay? So you break the bell bound two to minus six, and then you go up, up, up by two, by two, by two, and this has a you can show this is this brings a lot of information about quantum state. Why? Because below two to minus six, all spins are not well correlated. If you go one step up in this uh, exponential ladder, multiplying by one half, if you go one step up, you can show that there are maximum three qubits that are not well correlated. If you go one up, there are maximally two. There are different possible uh, configurations here, but there are maximally two bell encoding. If you go one step up, there is maximally one. You see, three to one, what, and all that is above two to minus three up to this uh, JZ value one fourth means that all qubits are uh, formed uh, a composite bell correlated system. So, this object, you know, this single element of this matrix not only tells you if you break the, the bound or not, but it also tells you about the, the internal structure a lot. It's just a single element. I, I, when I learned about this, this was a bit surprising. So this is what we call non-locality depth. So 
how deep then what kind of things? When G equals zero, that means completely classical. Right? No, 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 then it's completely non-classical because then you have uh, anti-ferromagnetic, so you have up down, up down, up down, plus vice versa. So this is like a bit like a JZ state, but with local. Then we, uh, with Art of Nisgoda, this is why we basically still, uh, with Art of Nisgoda, we adapted this this uh, language to demonstrate that uh, Fermat locality is a resource for quantum metrology. So if you want to measure something very good, precisely, you have a collection of two level systems, which is natural for interferometric setups, where these levels represent the two paths through which your particle can travel. Then you can show that the precision of this uh, delta theta, which you would like to be below the shot machine, is directly linked with the strength of your bulk correlations. But I will, this is a bit complicated. I will skip uh, this, this part. Uh, now, two more slides and, and I'm finished. Uh, so far, what we dealt with was uh, individually addressable qubits, but uh, as in case of English uh, work, you, you would like also to measure something in, in bosonic systems where all, all particles reside in one trap. You cannot address them individually. You want to measure something uh, collective and then uh, certify the presence of their correlations. So you want to move from having individually addressable qubits to collective operators to be able to, to switch between these two scenarios when all these things resides in one trap and when, when all are separate. You can do this uh, and then you can basically mm -hmm. measure the bulk correlation, uh, well, calculate the bulk correlation, for instance, for uh, using a two mode, two, two, two mode uh, position condensates, which you have, for instance, in uh, in a B, when you take a BC in a double potential, and you can uh, scan the ground state. So, this is a static problem. You, having negative view, you scan the ground state and calculate the correlation orders, correlation functions of different. And if you zoom to this area around minus one, where we know that the quantum phase transition occurs, so your system breaks into a macroscopic superposition of all atoms being left and right. And it turns out that in the vicinity of the quantum phase transition, or actually all the correlations of all orders break the normal quality bound. So this is a very particular uh, point from the point of view of quantum correlations. And uh, the last slide uh, is about uh, a work which uh, we did with Amelia and Martin Quagin. Uh, so this is about uh, analyzing again a uh, bosonic uh, problem, but not dynamic. You take a Bosonian condensate, you're presented on this generalized block sphere, and you allow the two body interactions to to correlate the particles. What happens is that the system, which is initially a classical, a, a classical circle on the block sphere, gets squeezed in one direction at the cost of, so this is, a, it is squeezed here, but unsqueezed in the other direction. But what happens here is the system gets squeezed, so some fluctuations are reduced by the other are increased. If you want this reduced, to be good for you, then, then you're lucky. Not then you're lucky. But suddenly, this object, so the, the Cusini function in this case of this object, breaks into macroscopic superpositions. We call it Schrodinger, because we usually call it Schrodinger kittens, so small Schrodinger cuts. And uh, at the maximal point, you really obtain a macroscopic superposition of all atoms being here and here. And this is a true, genuine null state. And you can measure this <coughs> uh, with the, some non classical criteria. For instance, if you calculate the squeezing, your system gets squeezed, squeezed, squeezed up until more or less here. And then it gets into such a non classical regime that your spin squeezing does not tell you anything. It, it is more non-classical than 
simple measure allows you uh, some other measures like Fisher information, which will detect. And this is a platform review paper about you know, boosters and CFD. And we, what we did uh, with Amelia and Martin, we applied, uh, we took this system and we focused on, in particular, on these points where the Schrodinger cuts exist. And for this system, we calculated the bell correlation and we found that in this particular point, although that bell correlation has a very, you could say, chaotic behavior, there are these distinguished points where it, where it locally reaches a maximum in the bell correlation. The system becomes very strongly entangled and, and unclassical. And you can actually analytically predict these values and do some other stuff of which I will not discuss. Uh, we finished with, uh, a year ago with a media paper, uh, very similar to the previous one. So not so dynamical, but not in a bosonic system, but on a spin chain. Just took uh, more than a year to, to well, almost a year to, to publish, finally got it. And uh, I also worked with uh, Danish Hansa now on uh, statical problem and analyzing from the point of view of correlations the vicinity of this quantum phase transition in a PC, but I don't want to, to push too much. So, very non locality is simple for simple systems, or less simple, it's not as simple, but it's still quite simple. And uh, there are surprisingly many applications, and probably the the only takeaway which I would say is important is that you can say a lot about the quantum system from just one element of the disk. And as I say, for me, it is all it, it was a mixed process. It is just a single element. It is very exotic, but it is one. Thank you. Thank you. No time for more objections. Okay. So, from what I understood, you are mostly interested in studying quantum systems which are kind of local in that sense. Like, usually, if you are studying global systems, they are all together. Uh, so, why are you using non locality and maybe not like contextuality? Because I think that uh, no, no, not, not on, not on, uh, by local, you mean that uh, like you, you have everything, like, you cannot ensure that they are spatially separated. No, but when you have a spin chain. In principle, they are specially naturally doing uh, uh, causally separated measurements on uh, objects which are separated by five microns is maybe <laughs> not that yeah. quite trivial. Uh, but still, this is an uh, I would say it's a. I mean, because here I think also to ensure like that the measurement choices are independent, you have to also have the choice. Outside of the like the white um, cone, so yeah. Okay, but if you look at, I, I assume, but if you look at the problem as a as a as a way of detecting bell correlations, which then you show are useful for something, then you do not need to make sure that you fully deny the uh, postulates of localism with this independent sense. Then your goal is just to detect a particular type of correlation and then to show. Like we did in some paper, that it is actually useful for some. But I see your point. Yeah. Uh, more questions? Okay. So, uh, the fact that a single matrix element can tell us so much about entanglement is striking, but on the other hand, it would be extremely difficult to measure this particular element. Yeah, because it's the most different model from the, from the diagonal. Uh, do you have maybe some inequalities which would be sensitive to higher uh, correlations, but not they depend case. only on the uh, collective model? So you were showing this example from uh, Dennis' paper mm -hmm. uh, when you need first of actually collective. Uh, yes, so two body correlation. Is it possible, I know, to employ like uh, reports of that? Yes. And, uh, learn yes. more about the correlation of you that? Yes, so uh, th this works starting from three, uh, from third order up. So you can construct, for instance, for uh, three uh, from correlation functions of third order of collective spins. Mm -hmm. 
and this is uh, much simpler, but this is it's simpler not really to access, but it, it restricts your amount of information which is squeezed out of your system. Mm -hmm. For the more quantum state you have, the more vulnerabilities to tracing out is some parts. So you know it's either either this or that. Then having so many equations which is based just on collecting spins. Is it possible to say something about entanglement there? Yes. The same way like I showed about the locality that's in the in the chain system. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, absolutely. So can we um, classify the case when the operator is commuting, but the state is entangled state? In that case, you can classify certain uh, inequality, a domain in in very, very inequality. For example, like uh, all two operators are just position operator, they are all commutes, and then but you can write the uh, entanglement state of two position uh, uh, eigenstates, and then you can use certain inequality. So, so can you have a for instance, a single part or two part two particle and position two two positions x yeah. one x two and mm -hmm. uh, y one y two yes mm -hmm. so the measure the uh, uh, that's a good question uh, so then the local uh, operator uh, the two local set no but it's just one operator it's just one operator position yeah. giving two outcomes. But just one operator. One operator, but in two different positions. No, no, but these are the outcomes. These are not the operators. Mm -hmm. You're observable is X locally. Right. But the outcomes are X1, X2. So to take by you know, locality, you would, you would have to change some, well, I don't know, do some mixing locality, some other stuff to, to have a non-commuting. Anyway, we have to have a non-committing setup. I'm not sure, uh, I mean, is it, is it always, I, I think I we think always need to have uncommuting observables to non-commuting observables locally. Okay. Um, so um, I'm not an expert in this field, I'm just curious. So it seems to me that there's a plethora of potential inequalities you could assume about uh, yes. Whatever systems you, you can decompose into subsystems. Okay, but is there a kind of general notion of of states which are certainly classical in the sense that nobody will ever bring an inequality under which this state is non classical or or not? Well, well, few states this would be a product. Yes, few states are sort of simple. But for for a, uh, these states, this would be a separable state, a separable state. But the, you know, you obtain some quantum state and uh, you don't know. Mm -hmm. I just wonder to what extent all this game depends on the particular choice of an inequality you use to measure your. Uh, it does. The, 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 co the construction of inequality is crucial. So maybe I can on that. So there are mixed and tangled states, but you don't violate any of So it's like not. Uh, but this is known for, for two weeks or more. For a model. For all, for all, for all. For all. So for n qubit systems, yes? No, no, not only qubit systems. Definitely. Mm -hmm. N subsystems. Yes. Okay. N subsystems of finite dimension. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there are some. Ah, yes. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. So thanks for a nice talk and understandable. Uh, could you go back with your slides? Now I see only summary. And I would like to, in fact, make a short comment. Uh, just go back, back, back to show us um, embedded X plotting the space of states. So my remark is rather simple. So go back, please, a couple of slides. They were not numbered, so I don't recall the number of it. More? Yes, more, more. To see uh, three sets embedded one into another. Entangled states, bell states. Let's go back. Ah, okay. ah, this one. Here. Yes. 
So look, from my perspective, this picture, very nice, is a bit misleading. Why? Because uh, the set of separable states is convex set well in the interior of the set, and then entangled states are outside, EPL outside, and bell states are as close to the boundary as possible. So, uh, being in your shoes, I would redraw this picture just in the opposite way, to put the blue bell at the, close to the boundary and put those row in the center. Yeah, I, and I think this is usually done in the literature. Yes, thank you. Yes, yes, I agree. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Any more questions or comments? Uh, hi, can I ask a question quickly? Sure. Um, so I have a follow up from the the first question that was asked. So they um, so it was asked whether um, essentially these uh, bell correlations could sort of be faked by uh, the fact that your particles are close together and talk to each other classically. And your your response was that um, yes, that might be the case. But you showed that these bell correlations are still a useful resource, or like a useful resource. And so it's it's interesting that you can get them anyway, right? If I understand correctly, is that so what? Yes. Yes. So um, my question is kind of, if these bell correlations are a useful resource, as you in this way that you say, um, and I can click and I can sort of, um, and I can fake them classically using particles to talk to each other. Does that give me like an easy way to exploit no, these correlations no, no, no. for I these tasks, that. or are they only useful if they are actually fundamentally like entanglement quantum? Yes, they must be fundamentally quantum. Okay, yeah, I, I see. I, I don't think I said they can be faked. I'm okay, just but they, they can, right? If your particles just talk to each other classically during the setup, then they can't be faked, right? If, they, if there is communication, then yeah. Yes, but uh, okay, so the research is a genuine, is a genuine bell correlation. Right? Yeah, this okay. Yeah. And then, um, I may I may have misheard, but um, just as a quick comment on the thing about um, commuting observables, you you need non-commuting observables at your local sites to exhibit like a, a Bell inequality violation. That's a that's a generic statement. That's all, that's always true. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, because if yeah, if you don't have um, non-commuting observables, then you just sort of write everything in a basis where everything commutes, and then you're dealing with classical probability theory, and so there can be yeah. nothing quantum. Uh, like in your correlations. Yeah. I agree. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, okay, so uh, uh, if there's no more questions, uh, let us send the picture.